Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the second part in a crisis response series that we're doing in response to some of the more challenging issues that we're facing in schools. And we'll continue to do these as issues arise during the course of the year. So again, I'd like to welcome you. My name is Karen Bingard. I'm the Executive Director of the New Jersey Principals and Supervisors Association. This year, more than ever due to the pandemic, we are all focused on what the students need to feel supported, recognized and valued as they come back into our school buildings. Perhaps the past year and a half at home has been a relief to some of our students or a prolonged torture to others. And perhaps the return to the classroom leaves students feeling similarly off balance and questioning their belonging in schools they may not even know. For students in populations that are historically marginalized, school may never have been easy and may be even harder now. As part of a concerted legislative effort to create more inclusive schools where students are seen, heard, and valued for who they are, Chapter 32 was created to embed in the curricular planning of our schools what many schools were already doing in their climate and culture work, creating a space where each student is given the opportunity to see others just like themselves who will inspire them to aspire to reach their own dreams. One of these areas is gender identity. Our goal in today's presentation is to help you navigate the legal requirements, the terminology, and the challenging nuances of personal beliefs that may conflict with students' rights so that you feel prepared to address not only the pencil and paper work of curriculum, but more importantly, the heart and soul work of creating an environment where all students feel that your school is their school. We know it's not easy always looking to be practical and give you takeaways that you can apply, we hope to give talking points and a deeper understanding of these issues to help you de-escalate the arguments that are coming from places of disagreement or misunderstanding to move to doing what schools often do best, which is to serve as a town center to their communities, making connections and building bridges. Now, it's my pleasure to help introduce each of our panel members, each of whom is eager to engage in this important work and conversation today. It's my pleasure to introduce Donna McInerney, the CEO of FEA, David Nash, the Director of Legal Education and National Outreach for FEA, Christina Donovan, the Director of the School Counseling Program at Georgian Court University, my alma mater, by the way, Christian Fuscarino, the Executive Director of Garden State Equality, Andrew Perry, the Principal of Washington Elementary School in the Westfield School District, and Anthony Scotto, the Director of Curriculum and Instruction at Hamilton Township Public Schools. And without further ado, I'm going to kick this over to Dave Nash. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Karen, and thank you all for joining us today. We know how incredibly busy all of you are, um, all of the demands on your schedules. Uh, so we're going to help you understand how to address the many challenges that come with supporting this critical student population of our transgender students and understand uh, the legal requirements and important legal developments uh, that we are experiencing um, addressing issues of gender identity. Of course, as we walk through our presentation today, uh, we're giving you uh, critical legal information, but we're not providing legal advice on handling particular matters. Um, with that caveat, we do want to encourage you as we go, type in questions that you might have. Um, we have a very large uh, group of um, individuals who joined us today. So we will do our best to respond to your questions, but we will make sure to capture all of the questions um, so that we can review those even after our event is over today. As far as what we're going to cover, uh, we'll begin with a review of some current legal requirements related to gender identity, both at the state and federal levels. Uh, we will review some key terms and concepts. We'll review some key uh, legal principles and best practice principles related to supporting tra transgender students. Uh, we'll give you some potential scenarios to consider and help you think through how to address various types of situations that we are seeing in our schools in New Jersey and around the nation. Uh, we will encourage you as we go to type in questions that you might have. And of course, we'll give you um, some helpful resources so that you can think through how to move forward in your school, in your district. 
So we thought we would start uh, with an important recent development. Uh, chapter 32, as Karen uh, mentioned, um, is a new law that we have in the state of New Jersey that requires us to have a curriculum in place K through 12 that addresses issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, I know many of you have been doing this for years in your curriculum in so many wonderful ways. Um, this does formalize that requirement. It does also make clear that this is K through 12, um, a requirement for us to address these issues. And one of the things that you'll notice when you look at this slide summarizing the statute is that there's nothing in here that says that a parent um, could choose to opt their child out of participating um, in this particular curriculum. Uh, so the curriculum includes um, a number of important issues that we have to address when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. For our purposes today, we're focused on issues of gender identity and expression, um, but the statute makes sure that we're addressing issues related to race, disability, religion, ethnicity, a broad range of other characteristics as well. We know that New Jersey has been a leader in addressing many of these issues. So even before chapter 32 had been adopted, uh, we had put in place in 2019, a requirement for schools to address at the middle school and high school level, uh, the political, economic and social contributions of individuals with disabilities and gay, lesbian, bisexual and transgender people. Um, and that curriculum requirement has been in place for now two years. Um, Many school districts are doing wonderful work. You're going to hear about some great work uh, that Garden State Equality has been leading um, on this front um, and some of the wonderful resources that are available to school districts. We also have seen, unfortunately, um, some strong uh, negative reaction. The vast majority of school officials have been incredibly supportive of this requirement. Uh, but we do show you here one example of a school board member um, making a comment um, in an email uh, indicating that she was disgusted and appalled by the uh, requirement to address political, economic, and social contributions of these populations, uh, finding it, uh, in her words, repugnant that someone's sexual preferences have anything to do with their contributions or achievements. We wanted to um, include this slide to make sure that you're aware that when these sorts of comments are made, this can become a matter of public record. In this particular case, an Open Public Records Act request was made to see this email and the request had to be complied with. If a teacher or a school administrator um, had decided to make similar comments, uh, very likely we, we would be looking at um, serious potential disciplinary action because of the impact this would have on students uh, to make this sort of a comment. So we wanna be aware and we wanna make sure that your staff members are aware of the parameters of their First Amendment rights um, and make sure that as we're making comments either in the workplace or even on social media, uh, that we're aware of the potential impact of those comments on others. The New Jersey Department of Education has um, put out very strong guidance. Uh, they did this in 2018 on addressing transgender student rights. Um, that guidance um, really has put us in a strong position as a state. Um, so we encourage all of you to refer to that guidance. Uh, you all will have access to today's presentation and the recording from today's presentation. Uh, but in the uh, slides, we do have a number of active links, including uh, the link here to the NJDOE guidance from 2018. Um, it includes important definitions. It's important for us to have a consistent understanding of terminology so that we can be affirming and supportive of all students. Uh, one important legal concept to stress is when students tell us who they are, tell us uh, their gender identity, um, we need to affirm those students. Uh, so school districts uh, sometimes have mistakenly thought that unless we had a quote unquote legal name change for a student, that we could not change the student's records when they were telling us their gender identity. Um, in fact, New Jersey clarified in 2018 that we do need to affirm that student, including changing student records uh, when the student tells us that their gender identity and tells us they would like to be referred to by a different name. 
and gender marker. Um, so that's an important legal point. Um, every school district by now should have changed their protocols on this issue. Um, and it's not just a matter of protocol, it's a matter of affirming our students and who they are and sending an important signal to students. Uh, so the NJDOE guidance from 2018 walks through that, um, that issue and a number of related issues in great detail. Um, of course, the guidance also walks through uh, one of the questions that we often get when we talk about gender identity and expression, uh, the right of students to access restrooms and locker rooms based on the student's gender identity. Um, and that's an important concept that is in New Jersey law in our law against discrimination. Um, and it's an important concept that we need to make sure that we are affirming um, in all of our work and making sure that all of our staff members understand the rights of students uh, when it comes to um, every part of affirming their identity, including access to restrooms and locker rooms. New Jersey does have in place a law against discrimination that has included protections based on gender identity and expression since 2007. This is not new in the state of New Jersey. Uh, there are also protections under Title IX um, so that if individuals were being harassed because of their gender identity or expression, uh, we would have potential federal claims as well under Title IX. Um, so we have very strong protections at the state level. There are also protections at the federal level. We know as districts are implementing Chapter 32 and putting in place um, the new curriculum requirements, K through 12, to address diversity, equity, and inclusion, and in particular, um, putting in place curriculum addressing issues of gender identity, that there are some foreseeable legal issues that could arise. Um, that means that teachers need to thoughtfully put together lesson plans to address these foreseeable issues. And school administrators need to take the time to review those lesson plans and work with teachers so that we can properly address these important issues. So some of the issues that could arise, you could have students accidentally outing their peers. This could happen um, with um, bad intentions or just as students um, accidentally not thinking through what they're saying and sharing information that shouldn't be shared with peers. Um, so setting the stage to make sure that we reduce the chance of that happening. We know that the, there have been some parent objections, some attempts by parents to opt out of this curriculum. There is no opt out of this curriculum. The legislature made a conscious decision not to limit this to the health curriculum and to allow parents to opt out. Uh, we know that there have been a small number of staff members who have objected to some portion of implementing this curriculum on religious or moral grounds. Um, as a legal matter, if a staff member is charged with uh, teaching the K through 12 curriculum, you don't have the option to pick and choose which portions of that curriculum you're going to teach. Uh, so we need to make sure staff members understand that. Uh, we have to make sure that we do everything that we can to um, effectively honor the student's gender identity and expression. And that includes using the appropriate name, using the appropriate pronoun for that student. There could be mistakes that are made, uh, but we have to make sure that we minimize the chance of those mistakes um, and that we put in place systems so that we are using appropriate terminology with students. We know there could be ill-conceived teacher assignments that cause harm for students, which is again, the reason why uh, we suggest prioritizing a review of lesson plans uh, related to gender identity and the other important issues addressed in chapter 32. Um, we know that students could choose to share their personal experiences regarding um, either themselves or their peers related to acts of discrimination. Um, and if that were to happen during a classroom discussion, teachers need to be prepared to address that. Um, and we need to take steps in advance to try to reduce the chance of that happening um, in that form and letting students know other ways that they can ask for support if they are experiencing any of these issues. We know there could be political objections. Um, if those happen, for example, from board members or other political figures, it's important for teachers and school leaders to come together to make sure that we are supportive of each other and that the superintendent uh, becomes aware if we have any attempts to politically obstruct implementing this important curriculum. Uh, we do know that the stakes are high when it comes to addressing issues of gender identity or expression. We want to provide a safe, supportive environment for every one of our students. We know there's an increased risk for suicidal ideation and other adverse outcomes for transgender students where they don't have that important safety net that we need to put in place for all students. 
So on that topic, I thought I would ask Christina Donovan to um, comment for a moment on some of the reasons that um, this particular population is so vulnerable, some of those statistics and some steps that we should think about. Thank you, David. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So again, I'm Christina Donovan. I am the program director for school counseling for Georgian Court University. I'm also the administrative supervisor of student services for a large regional school district uh, here in New Jersey. Um, my background is all in school counseling, which is why I feel so passionately about ensuring that we are supporting all students. Um, and I feel that it is our responsibility. So you can see there's a lot of facts uh, that are listed here that can help you uh, with talking points as you are discussing this with members of your community. I do want to highlight some key findings. Uh, the Trevor Project completed this survey in 2020 and 2021, so this is really up-to-date information, um, and a lot of information came out of the pandemic as well, where our students were, uh, for the most part, not necessarily in a supportive school environment, but were at home. Uh, some of the main facts, suicide is the second leading cause of death in LGBTQ and transgender students, youth, ages 10 to 24 in the United States. Um, LGBTQ and transgender youth are four times more likely to think about, plan, and attempt suicide. The Trevor Project in this survey found that 19% of LGBTQ and transgender youth ages 13 to 18 attempted suicide in the year 2020-2021, which is a shocking number for me and I'm sure um, most of you, and I think that again expresses how important it is that we are providing protective factors here in our school district. Uh, when the Trevor Project looked at the overall breadth of suicidality in ages 13 to 18, they essentially found that a youth attempts suicide every 45 seconds in the United States, which again is um, a, a really you know, important number to remember. Now, I don't want to always be the doom and gloom presenter on these uh, projects. If we could go to the next slide, there are protective factors as well. And I think the main reason that we're having this webinar today and the reason that we are engaging in this dialogue is there are ways to combat that. Um, positive youth development, which I think everyone that is here is contributing to and being a part of, um, just the uh, occurrence of a gay straight alliance or an LGBTQ and transgender extracurricular activity significantly reduces suicidality and feelings of isolation in our LGBTQ and transgender youth. And parent engagement and family acceptance is another key factor. So this becomes a really important piece as we're educating not only other educators um, and our own faculty, but also engaging our parents and our community in a larger conversation. Um, for another standpoint, there are 343,000 and LGBTQ and transgender youth in New Jersey. Uh, and the last piece that I want to touch upon is remember, these are all self-reported numbers. So when you think about that aspect, this is probably pretty underreported. Um, and we want to take that into consideration as well. So for every student that there is um, that is open and out, there may be students in your classroom, in your school buildings who are not. And that's the other piece that is so important in ensuring that we are representing and supporting all of our student body. Thank Thanks you, so much. Thank you, Christina. It's so important to put this into context. Um, as I mentioned, of course, as we're addressing these issues, we're going to have um, inevitably students and staff members express themselves um, on these topics, um, hopefully in supportive ways of students and their colleagues, um, not always. So we wanna make sure that uh, we explain to everyone the appropriate parameters of First Amendment rights. Um, first, as a general principle, there is no First Amendment protection for hate speech to the extent that we are engaging in speech that is intended to demean and harm others, threaten others, um, undermine their sense of safety. Um, that is not protected speech for students or staff members. Uh, we know that uh, for students, uh, if they're engaging in speech in school or outside of school, that's likely to cause substantial disruption to the school environment, even for one student, that school districts not only have the right, but have the obligation to address that issue. Uh, we know that for staff members um, who are engaging in speech 
in or outside of school, if that speech tends to undermine the ability to work with students, parents, staff members, others in the school setting, that even speech that would otherwise be protected um, may not be protected because of the role that individual has as a school official. So it's important for school officials to always think through what is the potential impact of what I'm expressing, even if I'm doing it on my own time outside of school. And we have some case law that gives us some lessons um, about these issues. LW versus Tom's River was a, a landmark New Jersey case uh, decided by the New Jersey Supreme Court in 2007, where a student had been targeted for a number of years based on perceived sexual orientation. The student was bullied at the elementary level, it continued and escalated at the middle school level, continued and became uh, even worse and physically uh, violent at the high school level. Um, and New Jersey Supreme Court in that case made clear that the actions were a violation of the New Jersey law against discrimination and that school districts had a legal obligation to take measures that were reasonably calculated to end the harassment, not simply to follow their code of conduct. If you have a situation where a student is continuing to be harassed, uh, where we have a code of conduct that's just not working, we need to show that we're taking other steps. The LK and TK case was a, a recent uh, decision uh, regarding an alleged bullying case of a second grade student. Um, second grade student who alleg allegedly targeted another second grade student because of gender identity. Uh, the commissioner of education did make clear in that case that even a second grade student if we take the time to explain to that student um, the harmful impact of their words and actions. Um, and this, these are difficult concepts, of course, for a second grader, but even a second grade student could engage in harassment, intimidation, or bullying of another second grade student if they choose to engage in behavior once we've taken the time to explain the potential harm of what they're doing. Um, on the other hand, we do have to think about what we expect children to know and understand at various grade levels. Um, so we would expect a higher level of understanding at the middle school or high school level, and we need to show that we're taking the time to explain the ramifications of our actions to our younger students as well. Uh, the Melnick case that you see here um, stands for the principle that staff members can't pick and choose what they're going to implement in the curriculum or revise the curriculum um, and argue that this is a First Amendment right that a staff member would have. Um, federal court made clear in this case, you don't have a First Amendment right uh, to say what you want in a classroom and to somehow alter required curriculum requirements. Um, and the Gina Priano Kieser uh, tenure case um, is a case where we had an ill conceived lesson plan where students were asked to reveal um, embarrassing moments in their lives in front of their classmates. Um, the district was unsuccessful in bringing tenure charges because the lesson was right there in the lesson plan, and it had been for years. This case um, underscores the importance of reviewing lesson plans to make sure they are well thought out, they are appropriate, they are supportive of our students. So. Um, we, of course, have a legal duty of care that we always want to keep in mind to provide a safe environment for all of our students, protect from foreseeable harm. We do have a legal requirement to make sure that our staff are properly trained to understand concepts that may not uh, be easy to understand, including concepts related to gender identity and expression. We do have an obligation to engage in progressive supervision as needed. Uh, so if, for example, a staff member is continuously not affirming who a student is, is continuously uh, choosing to use the wrong uh, name and pronoun, uh, we should be engaging in progressive supervision and potentially in progressive discipline uh, for that staff member. We do wanna make sure that all stakeholders have necessary information so that they can reduce the chance of these issues occurring in the first place. We wanna make sure that we respect the due process rights of everyone involved um, as we're addressing these issues. We do give you a link to two wonderful planning documents as well. Gender Spectrum is a national organization that has developed a gender support plan to help school districts help students um, who are dealing with issues of gender identity and expression and a gender communications plan to help students with that initial um, coming out process and sharing who they are uh, with their peers and others in the school setting. So we encourage you to review those documents. 
So that was a very brief review of something that we um, spend an entire day on when it comes to reviewing legal principles. Um, but we could take a moment if we had um, a question or two that we would like to address at this point. Do we see yeah, any- folks have been doing a great job putting some questions into the chat. So right. the very first one, can a student's preferred name and pronouns be changed on all school databases and digital platforms without parental consent? Uh, so the answer is yes, the name and pronouns can be changed without parental consent. The New Jersey Department of Ed guidance makes that clear. I will say, however, that the one thing we don't want to do is be the one accidentally outing a student to their parents. So if a parent is unaware of their child's gender identity or expression, uh, you wouldn't want to change the formal records at that point and have that be the way that you're now outing the student to their parent. Um, but you do not need parental consent to make the changes in records. Um, if this child is telling you who they are, wishes to have the records changed, they need to be changed. All right, the next question. Can we have examples of specific accommodations that have been made in schools pertaining to bathrooms and locker rooms? So we do wanna be guided by what the student is most comfortable with on those issues. There are some students who prefer a private changing area. Um, and to the extent that a student um, who happens to be transgender is asking for that private changing area, we should be working to accommodate that request. Um, however, we also have other transgender students who do not want that particular accommodation, who want to be able to change with their peers. Um, so if that is the situation, we do need to honor that student's request. The Department of Education guidance does say that if another parent had um, some reason that they didn't want their child to be in that same um, changing area, that we should try to accommodate the other child as well. I would pay close attention to that issue. Um, it would signal a school climate issue and concern if you had a large number of parents asking to have their children removed from a locker room simply because there happened to be a transgender student changing in that locker room. So you want to be um, guided by what the a transgender student is asking for, what makes that student most comfortable. All right, thank you. Um, there's a question about reviewing slide eight again. Um, what I'm gonna say in response to this is um, if there's a specific question pertaining to slide eight, that would be helpful. Otherwise, I'm gonna offer that both the video of this webinar and the slide deck will be available afterwards to everybody. And you can certainly reach out to us with a specific question on that particular slide. Absolutely. Um, are student records still being changed if the parent, uh, sorry, no, I sorry, you already answered that one. Um, If the preferred name and pronoun has been changed in our student information system and the teacher is using the preferred name and pronoun, but other students in the class are not using the preferred name and pronoun, how should the teacher or school counselor handle this? So, of course, this could mean a lot of different things. It might just be that a student um, has been known to their peers by a certain name and pronoun for a long time and students are making innocent mistakes. Um, it could be a purposeful effort meant to harm or ostracize the student. So context matters. Um, you need to address the situation in every case because the student needs to be affirmed. Um, but I would not always assume a negative intent, um, intent from other students. Um, you want to try to sort of discreetly, um, privately address that issue with all the students involved, starting with the student um, whose name is being improperly used. Um, to try to understand the context. Is this coming from a, a place of bad intent? Is this coming from a place of misunderstanding and accident? Um, and that matters as we're determining what we do. It may or may not be harassment, intimidation, or bullying. Um, it could simply be students making an honest mistake and the student whose you know, name is uh, being mispronounced even understanding that. So you do wanna gather um, information on context in order to figure out the appropriate way to respond, but you always have to respond and try to correct it. And the flip side of that is the next question, what do you do if a staff member is not using the chosen name or pronoun? So um, we expect more of our staff members on a, whole, on a wide range of issues, right? I mean, honest mistakes could still be made, um, but there's no reason for that to happen on an ongoing basis with a staff member. So we do need to engage in 
um, progressive supervision for staff members if they have been given the appropriate information and continue to make mistakes. Uh, that's not acceptable and you don't wanna look like as a school administrator, you are condoning that. So it is important to document um, perhaps the conversation you have with that teacher. If there's another mistake, the disciplinary memo um, with that staff member and engaging in progressive supervision if this were to continue, hopefully that doesn't happen. On a similar awesome. note, if a staff member reports possible bullying related to gender identity and it does not get investigated, what then? Is the reporting staff member responsible for safety of the student beyond their report or request for an investigation? So if a staff member reports um, that a, a child may have been bullied um, and then the investigation never occurs, there's plenty of responsibility to go around. So remember the staff member has a legal obligation to report that verbally to the principal. If the principal is not available to the principal's designee the same day, sometimes a staff member will tell another colleague thinking they fulfilled their legal responsibility, that's not true. You can't assume if you told the nurse or a counselor that the information will make its way to the school principal. So you wanna make sure you've done the proper report and you've followed up with a written report within two days of the verbal report, within two school days. Um, if there was still no response, um, then certainly you could make uh, a higher level aware, uh, like the anti-bullying coordinator, like the superintendent of schools. Um, but you wanna make sure you're reporting verbally and in writing to the correct person, and that is the principal or principal's designee. Um, there are a lot of questions here, so I think we're going to take one or two more, and then we're going to continue with the rest of the presentation. If we have time, we'll come back to these, and we'll also see what we can do to provide answers in any follow-up materials that we give. But here's a doozy. Is there an objective standard for hate speech? Uh, so hate speech is one of those things that our courts have struggled with uh, for years. Um, it's one of those things where it's depending on what current community standards are. Um, so it's difficult to have a, a, a simple line on hate speech. If you're saying something that uh, would make another person reasonably feel um, unsafe because of a particular characteristic like race, ethnicity, gender identity, disability, religion, um, and it has, um, it has that impact on the student, you have your hate speech. So what we can do as a follow-up to this session, I think, is provide some more examples of hate speech um, because that's the way our courts have dealt with it. They haven't given a simple bright line. They have looked at specific cases and determined what is or isn't hate speech. But we have seen many examples linked to um, gender identity, um, sexual orientation, um, and a whole wide range of other characteristics. All right, let's do just one more. Is there is there guidance in regard to the age for when a student is able to decide on what their gender identity is? Uh, yes, um, a student at any age uh, K, in grades K through 12 has the ability to express who they are and we need to honor that student's expression of gender identity or expression. Research tells us that many um, children have a sense of their gender identity at a very young age, age three, four, five. Sometimes they have a difficult time explaining that to the adults in their lives, uh, but oftentimes the student has a sense of their gender identity at a very young age. So um, we do honor this request for students at all ages. Now, you, you, you do have the right to take the time to sit down and have a conversation with that student. Um, one of the things that you wanna think about is the student persistent, consistent, and insistent uh, regarding who they are and their gender identity. Um, so when you sit down and have that private conversation, um, you, know, you wanna make sure that the student um, is truly expressing this is their gender identity and then you honor it even for a very young child. So with that, we know, of course, there could be many more questions. Um, we will move on to a review of some key terminology. And it is important that we are using appropriate common terminology. Um, language is constantly evolving. Um, it's important as we think about terminology that we work with students on terminology um, and, and understand what is comfortable for that student. 
Um, the New Jersey Department of Education in 2018 did put out guidance. It provides one good source. Um, but again, it's important to remind us that language is constantly evolving. I did want to ask um, Chris, Christian um, if you could comment a little bit on some of this important terminology um, and try to stress the uh, importance of us appropriately using some of these key terms. Sure, thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christian Fuscarino. I'm the executive director at Garden State Equality. Um, and this slide that we're looking at right now is the, is the terminology that is provided through the New Jersey DOE. As David said, language is constantly evolving. And so this is a really good place for you to see some terminology that you should be using right now, but understand that things may change over time and that's okay. Um, just, you know, I've been doing this work for uh, nearly 20 years at this point, and the terminology that we were using in the early 2000s is not the terminology we are using today with a lot of the, the uh, items that are listed on this screen here. So it's important that you uh, make yourself aware of these terms, especially around um, the ones that David has listed here. Gender identity means a person, uh, a person's internal sense of gender. So when you are talking with your students and they're saying my gender identity is, that's how you are to refer to them. That's what the, the policy says. Um, you, you are within the law. I really appreciate what Karen said at the start of this panel discussion. And really this is the heart work, right? So we have a wonderful uh, uh, transgender student policy. We have the inclusive curriculum law. We have the other curriculum law that David went over. Um, we have the law against discrimination, but we know that schools aren't following the law. There are hundreds of schools in New Jersey that aren't following the law. And so it's important that we do the heart work, making sure that you are aware, aware of these terms, making sure that colleagues are aware, aware of these terms, making sure that we know what each other's rights are. And so, you know, just um, you can go on onto the website and review these terms here. There's some more terms that David put up on the screen here um, to understand you know, what a student is saying when they are saying that they are interested in starting their transition or that they may be identified um, as LGBTQ and, and understanding that Q sometimes means queer and it sometimes means questioning. Um, you'll, what you'll hear from older generation in the LGBTQ community that they, they're not comfortable with the word queer and that there is uh, a, a, an offensive uh, a connection to that term, but you're hearing from young people that queer and trans is like the way of the future, right? I, I would not be surprised if 10 years from now, it's we are identified as the queer and trans community and not the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so language is evolving. If someone says I'm queer or, you know, uh, my friend Johnny in class is queer identified, that's okay. Now, if, if a student is saying, you know, you're a queer, then you might want to question the intent in that language. You, you know, it's not a one size fits all when it comes to a language that has historical ramifications such as queer. Um, and then, you know, make sure you understand that everybody, uh, it, you know, ha has a, a gender identity. So you may be cisgender, right? If, if you have students in class that are not transgender or gender nonconforming or gender expansive, then they identify as cisgender. They may not know that, but you know that you know everybody has a gender. Everybody has a, an identity. One one side is not normal, and the other side is unnormal. You know, not normal. It, 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 everybody has their gender. So, David, if you want to go to the next slide, because I want to. Yeah, just... well, one quick point here too, yeah. Christian. Um, it's also important to recognize that we do have gender non-binary students, right? Um, and students who do not fit neatly into identifying as male or female. Um, so can you just uh, comment on that for a second? Sure, and and this is and this is where where we're seeing the state needing to catch up a lot on, especially forms, um, uh, you know, and in the athletic spaces for gender uh, non-binary students, you know, they may not identify with the male sports team or the female sports team, and so having uh, uh, you know classes, physical education classes that don't get broken up into two genders is really important to ensuring that the school environment is, is as inclusive as, as inclusive as everybody. Um, 
And you know, it's really about it's really about catch up at this point, um, and and making sure that we're not living in a binary structure. And so, just because something has always been the way it has, doesn't mean that it's the right way. Um, and so, it's really pushing back against these ideas that gym classes are broken up into two genders, uh, sleep away camps or marching band, whatever, go, going away. Or you know, the, there's a boys' bus and a girls' bus, or there's boy cabins and there's girl cabins. You need to make sure that there are options for non-binary students. And you also need to recognize that by putting, you know, uh, students in uh, gendered facilities like male and female, that was originally, you know, to make sure that they weren't going to be sleeping with one another and to protect the students individually. But that concept doesn't work when people are LGBT, right, or LGB. And so like the original reasoning for that to happen is, is, is false today, it's, it's invalid, right? Like you, you will have, you know, you may have uh, boys sleeping with boys and girls sleeping with boys and, uh, and well, you would, and girls sleeping with girls. And so this construct of separating students by gender just doesn't hold up to, to today's society. And I don't know if, if this was one of the stats that uh, was shared earlier with the Trevor Project, um, but, uh, you know, there, there are stats out there about how young people are identifying and more and more young people are identifying uh, at, at, or, or, or exploring um, different sexual identities. And so, especially at the time that they're in, you know, uh, senior year of high school, um, they're going to be wondering, do I like boys? Do I like girls? Do I like, you know, gender non-binary people? And who, 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 who am I interested in? And so these constructs just don't work for that mindset. They're outdated. You want to talk a little bit about the uh, wonderful curriculum project that uh, Garden State Equality has been leading? Sure. We, we, are, we are so, so, so very fortunate to be able to partner with uh, organizations like Make It Better for Youth and educators throughout the state to launch LGBTQ inclusive curriculum here in New Jersey. Um, we're really proud of this law. We uh, piloted the curriculum in schools before it became law. This last fall, um, uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Now it's been two falls. It, the COVID has got me screwed up here. And, and you know, shout out to the educators in New Jersey who have not only been uh, juggling the, the, the additional responsibilities of, of COVID and, and virtual teaching, but also implementing LGBTQ inclusive lessons at the same time. At the timing probably could not have been worse. But where we where we see these lessons being taught, we're seeing great results, and so it's it's really important that we continue to push forward, continue to look at the facts and not the misinformation that's being spread by some gubernatorial candidates and some by some school boards that are saying something's in the curriculum that's not. I love when folks say something's in the curriculum that's not because what make it better for youth and Garden State Equality have done is we've made the curriculum available to the public for free. So you can, you anyone can go to www.teach.lgbt and see exactly what inclusive lessons look like. Um, this is not some secretive gay agenda. This is um, very clear, well thought through uh, lesson plans that make sure that we're telling the complete history of uh, historical contributions from all people. So just real quickly, for example, in English class, you may have always learned about James Baldwin or Langston Hughes, but you may have never known that they were queer identified. Or in com your computer science class, you may have learned about Alan Turing, uh, who is really responsible for modern day computing. And you may not have realized that um, he was queer identified. And so it's about ensuring that young people can see themselves reflected in the lessons that they're learning. And what we know from that, and we talked about suicide earlier, is that young LGBTQ plus students see themselves reflected in the lessons that they're learning. They feel more confident about themselves. They know that there's a place for them in this world. And the non-LGBTQ students uh, are, are less likely to bully that queer or trans kid now because their favorite author is queer identified or their favorite computer scientist or athlete is queer identified. And so it, we know from California that rates of bullying drastically decrease when you teach inclusive lessons. And we know here in New Jersey through the pilot lessons that make it better for youth and Garden state equality did um, that, that this, there's nothing but positivity that comes 
from ensuring that lessons teach uh, uh, in inclusivity across all sub relevant subject areas. So let's pause for uh, another set of questions if we have additional questions. We do have a few. Um, let's actually start with the, the most recent one that was asked of Christian. Um, can you comment on the use of preferred, in quotes, preferred name pro and pronoun versus calling it an affirmed name and pronoun? As we mentioned, language is evolving and it seems affirmed is the more inclusive way to say things. That's a great question. So as I said uh, earlier in, in, in my remarks, what, what I used you know, in the early 2000s is not what we're using today. So we used to call them PGPs, which were preferred gender pronouns. And um, I, I, I have aged myself in some spaces where I said, what's everyone's PGPs? And folks say, it, you, know, you know, Mr. Fuscarino, it's not preferred gender pronouns. And so young people are really leading this, this language shift. And, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, and so we don't, we, we don't use preferred anymore because it's not someone's preferred pronouns. It's the pronouns that they identify by. It is their gender. Um, and so, you know, I, I personally wouldn't even use affirmed. I would just say, what's your name and pronoun? Um, uh, you know, I think that's just unnecessary language that may seem like there is a, 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 like a, a, an approach that's not necessary, but you know, if, 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 you're, if you're wondering what your, what your legal name is versus what the name of choice is, you know, that, that can be affirmed would be uh, reasonable to use there. But again, I, I, we, we don't ever want to use preferred at this point because um, the language has shift. This is, these are how young people and, and all people are identifying as, it's not how they prefer to be identified as. Right. Let's tackle one or two of the other ones that lingered from before because maybe we'll be able to get some of these done by the end of the session. Can you explain a little more on how to keep separate, separate records for the student's birth name and gender identity name and pronoun? Do we always do this? For example, if parents and guardians are not aware, where and how do you keep these records? The administration's office versus the counselor's office? Any concrete recommendations either from David or even from some of our principals on the call? So as a legal matter, there is a requirement to keep a separate record um, that has the students originally designated uh, gender identity and name. Um, I would be interested to hear from some of our other practitioners how you're logistically doing that, uh, but we are required to do that. I'll offer as a principal who, who retired just months ago, um, a lot of the student information systems have a um, kind of a background operating system element to it where the, the um, preferred name and pronoun can be on the front screen, the outward facing screen, and then the birth name can be on the, in the behind the scenes. And so um, it's part of the official record, but it's not necessarily out there for um, scrutiny by everybody in the building. Dave, can I also add something to that? Yes. Um, I've always felt that I'm the customer so when I'm dealing with a vendor, if there is something that I need, it is now my job to advocate for that and contact who I need to in the company. So maybe it's your, your, your student management system as Karen's referring to. And uh, maybe their, their first response is, well, we don't necessarily have that set up. And that's sort of a teachable moment for me to educate them on what they need to have. And, and, and as a customer, those are the things that I need to be thinking about when I renew the contract, when I decide if I'm going to move forward with that. And I know that that's easier said than done, but we also have to make sure that we are promoting this advocacy and, and excuse me, that we are advocating for other things. And a student management system should not drive what we do or not do that is right for kids. So just to piggyback on what Karen said, it's also that advocacy as well. Agreed. And here's another um, very important question, I think, uh, before we move into our next um, stage of the presentation. Do we inform other parents that someone who has changed genders is changing in the same locker room as their child? So there is no uh, requirement for us to do that proactive notice. What you wanna do is work with the student um, who is the transgender student um, about how um, you're going to communicate information and each student will have 
their own unique communications plan. Uh, that student might not want anybody else to uh, be aware of this information. Um, but in other cases, say many students already knew the student, um, knew the student by a previous name and gender identity. And working with a student, um, you may develop a plan that does have the school uh, affirmatively doing some outreach to others. So it really is driven by the student and what that student uh, wants you to do. But as the adults, you wanna try to help the student think through how to have the most seamless transition. So there is no automatic notice to others. Um, it's really driven by school officials working with the student. And David, can I jump in on this? Um, another component is I try to normalize the experience. So if you think about this from another protected class, you wouldn't notify parents that a student from the uh, from the Latin X community was changing in your child's changing room. That you would never even think to do that. So as we are normalizing um, our understanding of gender as a social construct, I think it's important to you know tie that into other protected classes and vulnerable populations that we work with on a daily basis. It's a great point. All right, so why don't we move to um, a number of uh, potential scenarios um, and talk through how we would respond to those scenarios. Um, Donna, do you wanna walk through this or would you like me to walk through just reading the, the scenario? So I, I can take care of it, David, thank you. One of the reasons, I'm gonna read, if people don't mind, I'm gonna read it out loud because we've got some people joining us with audio only. And then I'm gonna ask some of our panelists to respond to the scenarios. So in this first scenario, Ms. Walker is a second grade teacher. She has a lesson plan that she implements on Monday morning to review the concept of gender identity. On Tuesday morning at 7 a.m., Ms. Daniels, a parent of Jenny, a second grader, is waiting in the school parking lot when the principal arrives. She demands to know why her child is being indoctrinated by her teacher. She demands to know how you could approve Ms. Walker's quote unquote, crazy lesson plan. The principal promises to look into the matter and get back to the parent. A follow-up meeting with the parent is scheduled for the next day. The principal reviews the lesson plan after Ms. Daniels leaves. The lesson plan asks students to share their ideas on what gender means to them. Ms. Daniels said that her daughter Jenny came home from class and said that all the students in class were talking about their private parts. She also says that her daughter Jenny was reprimanded by Ms. Walker for asking Maria, the second grade student who used to be known as Mark, why he keeps quote unquote pretending to be a girl and then told Mark to go away when he tried to play with the girls during recess. What does the principal do? So I'd like to invite a couple of our, our panelist principals to respond to that. Andy, can you start us off? And Andy, you just need to unmute. Sure. So my first reaction is uh, being totally overwhelmed. And uh, just listening to the presentation this morning with as much uh, having heard so much of this before and lived through some of it, I'm still feeling overwhelmed. And if I had to think about these things coming my way, I'm... I'm overwhelmed. Um, so uh, the first thing that strikes me about this scenario is um, what my uh, epithet is, which is no surprises. So um, if you know so much of I so much of this is preparation, and as David has said, uh, school culture and climate. I would hope that. Um, that a second grade teacher at our school who's planning to do a lesson like this would give me a heads up. Is it my responsibility to check lesson plans? Absolutely. Am I, uh, am I going to pay as much attention to um, a second grade uh, math addition lesson plan as uh, a lesson plan where a teacher is going to introduce uh, gender terms to second graders? So um, teachers, 
uh, hopefully, hopefully we're all we're working in a place where teachers are going to give us a heads up about this, so that there are no surprises, and no um, Mrs. Walkers in the in the parking lot. Um, and um, when a teach, so the other thing that I think we all try and do, like I, I think all of our teachers always feel like all that the education community does is what else can we put on the backs of teachers and what else can we cram into the curriculum? And I know that what we've tried to do with so many things is integrated into existing places and how can we find things that we're already doing and, in, and include this in there. So I would hope that um, if uh, Mrs. Daniels feels the need to do a lesson, First of all, let's make sure that whatever she's going to do is in in the curriculum and uh, not something that she just thinks uh, her students need to know. And um, how can I uh, how can I uh, help her do this? How can I help find perhaps where uh, it fits right into a lesson that already exists? How can I make sure that there are other resources like the guidance counselor who might be able to join her the first time she's doing a lesson like this. Um, and uh, the other uh, really important thing that uh, I learned when uh, we, we knew, we knew that there was a, a, a transgender student who was coming up through uh, preschool and kindergarten and was going to be coming to our school, which also makes such a tremendous difference in each case, right? Whether someone is already out, whether someone is out, uh, you know, decides to come out in the middle of third grade or seventh grade. Um, and, uh, you know, we were all concerned and worried about, uh, about this and tried to prepare for it and boom, at uh, the first back to school night, one of the parents uh, asked the teacher, is there a transgender student in your class? And the, uh, the teacher responded uh, appropriately, um, you know, didn't say uh, yes or no, but, uh, but also was caught off guard and didn't know what to say. And that led to quite a wonderful faculty meeting where we talked about this and we're able to, uh, I mean, now we call them talking points, but the main point was that, you know, in our school, in any class, there are many students who have unique qualities and needs. And, um, you know, the law protects the privacy of, of everyone. And, you know, there are certain things that we can't share, but the point being that, uh, you know, I, uh, I think as uh, Christina just said, we were able to uh, roll it into like other things and not just focusing on, uh, in other words, a parent wouldn't say, is there uh, uh, an African-American student in the class or other or a Jewish person in the class? Um, and, uh, and another piece that we've talked about is when kids bring things up out of, out of context, especially um, that, uh, it's okay to say, um, you know, that's, uh, that's a topic that would be a great thing to ask your parents about. Again, it depends uh, on the age of the student, the grade, and then, you know, giving the parents a heads up that, uh, hey, Jenny may come home today and ask you about, uh, and, and ask you a question about Mark or something like that. I'll take a breath. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Andy. Thanks for sharing your perspective. And as you all can see, the scenario is, is rather complex. I'm going to ask Anthony Scotto to join in and, and share his insights. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'd like to, to go about uh, giving some feedback on this scenario as a director of CNI. And it would be my responsibility, along with many other stakeholders in the district, to think about what have we done as a district, as a department, as a school to support our staff when developing these lessons? And while this is a, a scenario that can happen at any time, you know, I think it's about being reactive and proactive. And so as leaders, we are often 
solving problems, putting out fires, reacting to when people call us. But I think it's important that as these matters come up, if they have come up in our schools, regardless of where we are in our continuum, that we look to see, have we provided principals, vice principals, supervisors, and instructional staff with the tools to develop lesson plans? Yes, it's, yes it is required that the principal review the lesson plan. And, and Andrew is right. There are so many other things that we have our principals doing every day, especially since COVID. But that doesn't take away our professional responsibility to make sure that we give Andrew and his faculty the, the tools on how to develop these plans. Um, I also see a word popping out of here and it's indoctrinated. And I think it's interesting how sometimes that's a, that's a key term that people will use loosely. And I have had to manage some phone calls in the last six months. And that's a term that I'm hearing more and more about. And I have to remind myself that my own, my office that I serve, my classroom that I'm in, my building that I lead is not a platform for me, but it is my professional responsibility to make sure that all of the students, all of the staff in a district have the tools that they need. So perhaps this could be sort of a PD opportunity also, besides lesson design and implementation, some scenarios. Why not walk the teachers through a scenario like this? I think about in, in many of, of our districts, there's someone that oversees the mentoring program. And are we including in our monthly checklists and our monthly communications with our mentors and mentees, how to address these matters? Could we include it in our new teacher induction program or our new teacher orientation? We don't know what we don't know at times. And so it's important that we help all staff. Now, if this real situation happens, which it probably has, and I get the phone call, I'm going to call the principal up and I'm going to say, walk me through what happened. A good principal will say, let me get back to you and do some further research. But I always appreciate when the principal is already somewhat aware of it. Like Andrew has said, that the teacher has taken the time to provide the principal or vice principal with a heads up. And I think something, just to close in this scenario that I learned a long time ago from an attorney is define the expectation. And I believe it is our professional responsibility to define our expectations as a district on what we stand for, what we believe in. And if it means going back to our transgender students policy and saying to ourselves, are we actually implementing this? or is it just on paper? So I, I think it always comes back to a learning coaching opportunity for our staff. And just a couple of, quick, couple of quick points on this one. Of course, um, it is appropriate to address issues of gender identity in the curriculum K through 12. So there's nothing that on its face tells us this was inappropriate for Ms. Walker to, to make those comments. And of course, in the second part of this scenario, we do see an issue of concern we don't have enough information yet, but it's possible we have a student who might be engaging in harassment, intimidation, or bullying of another student. Um, and we would want to look more closely at that issue um, and the comments that were being made to Maria uh, by Jenny um, and understand that situation a little more deeply. Dave, thanks, David. Donna and Dave, I just had one more thing here. I, I think when in education, when we put things just in buckets, these scenarios can happen more often. Um, I have been proud of the work that I've been able to do in my district, and I know I have a long way to go in the area of equity. This falls under that. I love the umbrella graphic that our organization has created. And the work that we're doing in equity and access all falls in this area. We shouldn't be seeing equity as separate. Equity is part of this, making, feel, making students feel, making all, the people that we serve in our district every day have the access and the equity that they deserve. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, and that, and along with diversity and equity, we, we always partner in the word inclusion, and that is incredibly relevant for these, these populations as well. Uh, I'm going to ask us to go on to the next scenario. Uh, in this scenario, a student comes to the principal and expresses concern that a girl is using the boy's lavatory, making him uncomfortable. He says he has also seen the girl using the girl's lavatory. He comments that the student looks like a girl one day and a boy the next, and that none of this makes sense. 
He wants the student to be forced to use one lavatory, the girls. He reports that he just doesn't understand why the student can't just be herself and be a girl. He also says that he knows that there are other transgender students in school who clearly identify as one gender and he's fine with that even in the lavatory. This situation though, and the back and forth leaves me feeling really uncomfortable, especially when the student walks in while I'm using the bathroom. And that's a quote from the student. How should the principal respond? So I'd like to invite Karen Bingard and Christina from the counseling perspective to respond to this scenario. Karen? Thanks, Donna. So this is actually an opportunity to have a really fantastic conversation between a principal and a student. And I think that the, the relationship building that comes of targeting um, really difficult topics, but coming from, you know, as we, as I referenced in the beginning, as a, from the place of heart in, in building those connections and helping to build understanding is just such an important role for a principal. In a situation like this, um, the student, the principal could actually sit and have a conversation. And frankly, this is, this scenario is based off of a conversation, um, slightly different circumstances though, that I had with one of my students. And, um, you know, my conversation with the student was, have you ever had a time when you have been, you know, on a team or participating in an event or at a party where you didn't feel that you fit in? And so what are your options? And the student would outline the options. And one of the options was either to, you know, kind of push in, lean into the situation and try to get engaged or to leave. And I said, okay, now you go home and your family is having a squabble around the dinner table and it doesn't involve you and it's making you uncomfortable. And what can you do? Well, I can finish my dinner. I can put my dishes away, hopefully, good teenager, and I can leave. And I said, okay, so now you go up to your bedroom and you're changing for bed at night and you take all of your clothes off and you see yourself in the mirror. And what you see in the mirror does not match how you feel inside when it comes to your gender identity. What can you do then? met with complete silence. And the student said, I never looked at it that way. And we had a really good conversation from that point on about trying to reconcile the mind with the physical and understanding that some of these differences go so deeply that there is literally no escape from it. And so it wound up being a really great conversation actually, like fantastic, probably one of my top 10 in 22 years as a, as a building administrator. Um, and of course, student went home at the end of the day, about 1030 that night, I get an email from the parent. How dare you talk to my child about a transgender student? Da, 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 da. So what I actually did was relayed the conversation to the parent. The parent actually replied back also saying, oh my God, I never took it down to that point of understanding that this student sees no other option. And it's really hard, I think, sometimes when we see students who struggle to reconcile from day to day, whether they identify as male, female, non-binary, what, where do they fall on this continuum? And it can be hard for people around them to understand that as well. So, you know, the response to a question like this, and frankly, any question when it comes to um, transgender students, LGBTQIA+, um, is really just to figure out ways to develop those relationships and also to work with your staff to develop those relationships as well, because we are, we are a career of heart and soul. We are all about building relationships and, and creating those connections that will help everybody understand each other. And so um, I think that that's just one of the most key elements in addressing these situations, because in the end, it's really hard for any other parent or any other student to turn around and say, I don't want that student to feel like he or she belongs in his or her own school. If it is always about making sure that everyone comes to his or her or their school and feels that that is the place for them, everyone can relate to that. And that's part of the process. And now I'll kick it over to Christina. 
Yeah, I think what struck me in this is it was such a wonderful opportunity to both develop a relationship and have a conversation. Um, and as as all of you know, when you're in a building and you're oh, constantly yeah. running, it could have been easy to just say, well, that's that student's allowed to use whatever restroom that they want to use and move on with your day. Um, but taking that extra time and having that conversation um, not only was a teachable moment, but again, a relationship builder. And I think that's really important. The other piece is that we want every student to feel um, supported and comfortable in their school building, as Karen had said. So in this situation, the principal could say, would you feel more comfortable speaking to your school counselor? You could provide this student with the opportunity to use a different restroom, such as in the nurse's office. If those are different options that um, are established to make sure that everybody does feel comfortable. Um, having a conversation about the fact that gender uh, is on a spectrum and that the social construct of male, female being one or the other is something that has evolved and we've learned a lot more about. So there's just so much new wants and how you can develop this conversation. Um, and, you know, kudos, obviously, to Karen, who had this conversation, and it turned out so well for, for everyone involved. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Karen. We really are seeing some common themes here about the need to build bridges, the need for communication and learning um, and transparency across all our stakeholder groups. Um, so this last scenario we're going to take a look at, and, and Christina, from your counseling perspective, I'm going to ask you to to, to respond. Uh, scenario three, you are a school counselor. You have a student, Tommy, who asks to see you. Tommy is very upset. He says that, quote unquote, everyone thinks I am a freak. He says that he just spoke with his best friend, Marco, and told Marco that he is transgender and is really a girl. Tommy says that Marco freaked out and asked Tommy if he is crazy. Marco told Tommy never to say that again, or quote unquote, some other kids here will kill you. Tommy says to you, I can't keep hiding who I am, but if Marco doesn't get it, nobody will. I can't do this anymore. What do you do? What information needs to be gathered? You ask Tommy what name and pronoun Tommy would prefer moving forward. Tommy says, I don't know. I was thinking, keep it simple, uh, Tammy. But that's just a fantasy. I don't know that will ever happen. I know I can talk to you and the principal about this. You're both cool, but no one else will get it. I wish I could just tell everyone. You ask about Tammy's parents and Tammy says, I tried, they went nuts. Dad threatened to throw me out of the house. So what do you do now? What information is shared with school staff, with Marco, with other students, with Tammy's parents? So Christina, could you respond? Yes. So um, I think first and foremost, um, and anyone who's a school counselor in the room is probably thinking the same thing, you would want to assess for safety. Um, I'd be very concerned about what's being presented here, the comment of I can't do this anymore. Um, the other piece is uh, we don't know what Marco meant by um, freaking out, asking Tommy if he's crazy, that could be from a protective factor of his friend being really concerned. Like we know that there's a climate culture in this school that would not support um, Tommy or Tammy. So I think it's important to also get more information after you have assessed for safety. So that would be the primary concern. And then of course you would follow what your buildings, policies and procedures are. Um, in my previous district, we would never have a school counselor assessed by themselves. They would always either gather myself or a school psychologist to assist with that, um, to ensure that the student was safe. Um, so we'll take this from the perspective that the student is safe. And then from there, you would want to gather more information uh, to have a better understanding to support Tammy. Uh, there's a wonderful resource that David Nash will be sharing, I think, at the end, and we saw it before, of a communication plan where you can work with Tammy to discuss how can we communicate this to other individuals in the school or outside of the school. A school counselor could offer to facilitate a conversation with the parents uh, to help support and affirm the student, um, and also with school staff as as well. You could invest into professional development to help Tammy's teachers in those conversations. So there's many, many things that, that you could do. Um, and then the other piece of this uh, that I think Karen brought up when we talked about this scenario earlier, um, this is a very different conversation if the student is five versus if they're 17. Um, you could have to get DCP and P involved if the student is sharing that, you know, dad was violent or dad threw the child out of the house and they're five, six, seven years old. So again, there's, there's so many layers to this. I think we could do a full day PD just on this scenario. 
Yeah, this is another one that's complex and multi-layered and lots more information that is needed. I'm going to open it up to the rest of our panelists um, to see if any of them want to respond to this particular scenario and its, its uh, different layers. One thing that I'll, I'll point out is that we do have Tammy telling us that she does want to find a way to communicate who she is. She's asking for that help, even while she doesn't think it's possible. So this is a time where school officials need to try to work with the student and show what is possible and to think about putting in place that type of communications plan. You know, I can't help but think about all the different responsibilities that we ask school counselors to do, whether it's um, coordinate and assist with state assessments, uh, take care of HIB, uh, manage, uh, manage um, schedule conflicts, right? I see Christina smiling and nodding. And, and so the, the responsibility that we place um, on our school counselors is great. And so a couple things, could there be uh, other sort of teacher leader people in the building that can take care of non scenarios like this, like let the, the trained professional uh, take care of this. And are there other non perhaps guidance matters that we can temporarily assign out uh, with a teacher leader, perhaps an intern? Um, I also think that we wanna make sure that our, our school counseling staff get the right PD as well. And I'm gonna continue to advocate for that no matter what. And so we're very good about sending them to um, compliance trainings. We're very good of sending them to test coordinator trainings, but have we given them a forum to learn more about this very scenario here? And for those of you, for those of us that develop the budgets for professional development, it's needed. It is needed, whether it be local funds or state funds, um, and that we we advocate for those staff members that they that they can attend the professional learning um, and be given the release time that they need. Because what happens is if we don't do it, now this scenario pops up and have we given the counselor the tools that he or she needs. And I think a lot of this comes back to just making sure that people really do, you know, as Anthony is saying, that they have the tools available to them. They have the knowledge available to them. You know, if you're that teacher who is on lavatory duty, sitting outside of a bathroom and signing people in and out, if you don't know that there is a student who is recently identified as transgender, you may not need to know who, but you need to know there is someone. So when that student walks up to you and you don't recognize the student, you don't know that student and the student signs in and then turns to go to the bathroom that does not match what you might be seeing, you know that there is a possibility out there that this could happen. And you don't do the redirect the, re, you know, redirect the behavior thing that teachers do, that we all do um, and, and say, wait a minute, don't you mean that one? Um, you know, because you know that this is a possibility. So it is really establishing the environment in a school where this teachers will feel empowered by knowing that they know what is expected of them and they know when there is something that could be coming their way. Um, and I think that's something that we all wanna work on. And professional development is certainly going to be a very pivotal part of this. I've been loving reading the chat and I urge everybody to do that um, because some great ideas are being shared there as far as resources that are available. And we're also gonna highlight a few of them in a couple of minutes um, also. But uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that will really be helpful in empowering our school leaders and our teachers to make our schools the environment, the welcoming environment that they want, we want them to be for all of our students. Some great points made by all of our panelists and you're right, building the capacity of our, our school personnel, giving them the resources, the time, the professional learning they need to do this work that they know, that we all know is so critical and vital. I wanna thank all of our panelists for sharing their wisdom and experience um, I think it's important to, to the scenario work really solicits a lot of deep conversations and perspectives and can be a great professional learning tool in your own schools and districts to keep the conversation going. At this point, I'd like to take it, send it back over to Dave to talk about some of the uh, takeaways from today and to talk a, a little bit about some strong talking points that will help you in your work back in the districts. Dave? Thanks, Donna. Uh, so wonderful conversations that we've had and some important points that I want to make sure we do take uh, from today's conversation. We want to make sure that teachers know that we have their back, that we are supportive of them 
as they are implementing some of these new curriculum requirements that we are putting into place. There's nothing wrong with a teacher expressing factual assertions, including assertions um, that they need to explain to students linked to issues like gender identity. So we wanna make sure that we're supporting our staff members when they are doing the right, sometimes difficult thing to do um, in putting in place uh, these important curriculum concepts. Um, it's critical for Board of Education members to understand the code of ethics. We are seeing on a wide range of issues, tremendous pressures being placed on school board members, uh, some concerning things happening at school board meetings, and there's a temptation for board members to start commenting on individual students or individual staff members um, and real or perceived issues at those board meetings. And that is outside the role of a board member to make those personalized comments about students or staff at board meetings. So it's important that we take the time to continuously educate our board members um, about the appropriate time and place if we do have those types of questions. As we mentioned a number of times, there is no option for us to opt out of chapter 32 curriculum requirements. Uh, so we wanna make sure that uh, students and parents understand that the uh, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion are critical issues that we need to make sure all students have exposure to. Um, and we take the time to educate parents about these issues, but not to allow um, individual students to opt out. We know, of course, that students and staff members have First Amendment rights, uh, but we have to understand the parameters of those rights. If students are saying things that they reasonably should know will cause harm to another student, um, that is not protected speech. Uh, so speech that is hate speech, lewd or vulgar speech, or causes substantial disruption um, is not protected speech. And we wanna make sure that students and staff understand that. Uh, there's a legal requirement for us to make sure we're equipping our staff members. So when it comes to professional learning, what we've stressed over and over again, we have a requirement to provide that ongoing support so staff members can effectively meet these uh, important needs. It's critical for school administrators, as we've said, to review lesson plans. Uh, we know how many things are on your plate as school leaders, uh, but it's important to take the time to uh, think through and review those lesson plans and support our staff members we can minimize potential issues by being proactive on that front. We know that high quality curriculum uh, requires diverse content reflective of the population and the world. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are looking at our curriculum and that we're looking at this larger umbrella of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and addressing issues of gender identity and expression within that larger umbrella. Um, being transparent is very important. We need open lines of communication. Oftentimes, um, parents are concerned because they have heard misinformation or sometimes active disinformation about what you're doing in the district. Uh, so taking the time to share information uh, with parents, with students, with staff um, about the direction you're moving, um, making that information very available on things like curriculum um, will allay many of those fears. Uh, it does take courage sometimes to do the right thing. We need that courage at all levels. So uh, it's important when teachers are doing what they need to do in a classroom and counselors are doing what they need to do, that they know they have support uh, from all levels of administration. Um, and we need to take the time to be proactive in thinking through some of the foreseeable issues that we talked about today um, and putting in place systems and strategies to address those issues. Uh, given the complexity- Is it good? Is it edible? <laughs> Uh, we do have mute that person. Uh, given the complexity of the issues that we're addressing um, when it comes to gender identity and expression, um, expertise is really important. Uh, we have some incredible expertise with us in our presentation today. Uh, groups like Garden State Equality do phenomenal work um, on these issues and have done great work working with uh, school districts all over the state. Uh, you want to take advantage of that expertise, bring it in when you need to to help equip everyone. And having that common language and common messaging is so important. Um, so taking the time to make sure everyone understands some of these essential terms and that we're constantly working at this because our language is evolving on these issues. So a few quick talking points uh, for us to take away. If you're confronted on an issue without having all information, 
thank the person for bringing that issue to your attention. Um, let them know that you wanna make sure that you have all the information necessary to respond and that you'll take uh, the time to gather that information and get back to that person. Sometimes when an angry uh, parent or, or another uh, person confronts you in the moment, the best thing to do is to say, I need to um, take the time to gather information. Don't always feel like we have to respond in the moment. Uh, when you're accused of promoting a political agenda or ideology, um, assure the individual that you and your district are committed to making sure that we implement state instructional requirements without any political ideology and ask for specifics. If you're getting this uh, sort of vague assertion that uh, there is something political or ideological in the curriculum, uh, try to draw that person out and get specific issues it's very likely that once you get those specifics, you'll be able to address them and show that there is no uh, political issue at stake here. There is no ideological uh, point of view being pushed, uh, but you wanna get those specifics so that you can respond appropriately. When you're challenged about whether concepts of gender identity should even be taught at the elementary level, um, again, um, the state of New Jersey has decided uh, that we do need to address these issues at that level um, and assure the individuals that you have a well-vetted curriculum that's factual in nature. You're addressing these issues in an age-appropriate uh, manner. Um, and again, if there are specific questions, sometimes uh, folks have these generalized concerns, but when you get down to specific questions, you can explain exactly what you're doing in the curriculum to address those issues. As we said, when a parent asks um, to have their child opt out of this curriculum, um, as with many other aspects of our state mandated curriculum, the legislature did not provide an opt out. And it's a very good reason for that. We wanna make sure that all students are exposed to these important concepts related to diversity, equity, and inclusion on a number of fronts, including issues related to gender identity. Uh, when parents indicate it's their job to teach their child about sexual issues. Again, you want to assure the school districts are an appropriate form to convey through the curriculum, factual information relating to issues such as gender identity, expression, and sexual orientation, and the need to understand and be supportive of our diverse student population. Um, this is a fundamental part of what we do in schools. This includes addressing um, in the curriculum, as we know, political, economic, and social contributions of LGBTQ plus persons. And you wanna um, try to educate parents given the increased risk of serious and lasting social, emotional, and physical harm for transgender students who don't have a strong support system. And we know this, as, as you saw in the data, it's critical that schools work proactively to ensure that safe and supportive learning environment. So students need to see uh, role models that look like them, need to understand that they do have a place in this world um, and it's important for us to proactively address that in the curriculum. So I will uh, take one more opportunity for Q&A, Karen. So actually, I think there was one um, question that was posted earlier that um, tied really nicely in with what you were just talking about, David. Um, and the question had to do with staff members being very concerned about legal repercussions against them in school if they do use the chosen name and pronoun. Um, for coming from parents who don't agree with um, the child's, you know, professed identity. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, great question. Um, so in that case, the school um, leader or teacher is doing exactly what they're supposed to do under state law. Um, if there ever was litigation, a parent brought a lawsuit in a case like that, the individual staff member would be indemnified they would be um, protected by the school district who would cover any legal expenses. Uh, they would ultimately prevail against any claim because the individual is acting appropriately uh, to support that child and consistently with state and federal law. Um, so I wish I could guarantee there would never be litigation, but if that ever were to happen, you would have the support of the district and you would be fully protected. And I, I would like to add to that, the reminder that you know, from, from that student's perspective, the, the six or so hours that they spend in school each day is a really big chunk of that student's life. And if you are yourself in those six hours of the day, it will strengthen you 
outside of those six hours to kind of hold your breath and wait until you get to school the next day. And school becomes the haven, the safe haven, the welcoming place that we want it to be for all of our students. So if, you, if your students know that they're gonna walk into your, your, your counseling office, your classroom, um, your sports team, your club or activity and be seen and valued for, for who they are, um, that makes all the difference in the world. And the legal stuff, you know, hey, we're in education, the legal stuff happens. It really does. The law in this case prevails and supports what you would be doing, but more importantly, that student would be getting what that student needed. And that's that's just the most important thing of all. Absolutely. I also, David, wanted to point out um, a, a point that was raised when we were talking a little bit earlier, which I think is an important one to share. In normalizing the needs and experiences of our transgender students, it's important to not use normalizing strategies that then invalidate the experiences of other marginalized group identities. The challenges of our Latino and Latina students are often rooted in racism and not transphobia. We have a duty to recognize that the complexities of racism in education should not be compared with the challenges of our LGBTQ students unless those students' identities encompass the intersectionalities of race, culture, and gender identity with the parenthetical statement that this is said with love. And I think the reality is that all of this comes from a place of love and that, you know, there are sometimes comparisons to be made between uh, marginalized groups and that sometimes to understand what one group goes through, it's important to build a comparison to what another group might experience. But I think we all take very seriously the importance of recognizing the unique um, background struggles, experiences of each of the groups in our world who have been in some way pushed aside um, and made to feel less than, and that's not what anybody ever wants. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna reiterate, make sure that you take a look at this chat because there are some great ideas and great places to get some um, support for future, uh, for other professional development that people have done and some great ideas built in here. Um, and with that, I think we probably can move on to the next thing because that's going to touch on a lot of resource information. Absolutely. So we have some wonderful resources that we are providing links um, to for you, um, including uh, resources that were uh, for incorporating instruction on diversity and inclusion in the K through 12 curriculum. There's some wonderful information from Garden State Equality on their uh, pilot work um, on this curriculum. Um, the guidance from the New Jersey Department of Education that again came out in 2018 and really needs to be implemented in every school district in the state of New Jersey at this point um, that addresses many of these issues. Um, some wonderful resources from Learning for Justice, which some of you might uh, have known as Teaching Tolerance um, on Gender and Sexual Identity Resources. Um, and Gender Spectrum, national organization that has developed uh, some very useful um, support documents um, to help you support uh, our transgender students, including a gender support plan, very comprehensive template for helping you think through how do we support a student and a gender communications plan, which provides a wonderful detailed template for thinking through how do we help that student communicate who they are um, to their peers and others in the school setting um, and having the student at the center of planning that process with you. Uh, so great resources there. Uh, Donna, you want to talk about some of the wonderful uh, resources available through FEA? Thanks, David. Um, yeah, professional learning and having opportunities to discuss best practices is a critical piece of all of this work. And so I encourage you to go to our njpsa.org website and check out all of the professional learning resources we have. This is an Equity in Action Academy that was just launched this past summer with several cohorts. Um, and then David, if you go to the next screen, uh, when you go to our website, you'll see some of our online learning courses uh, that are asynchronous. You'll see our catalog. And we have also really expanded um, our cadre of coaches across quite a few areas in working with leadership teams and working with PLCs in working with teacher teams uh, because we feel that the power of coaching can really support the sustainability piece of the professional learning work. David? We have also, through Legal One, made a number of resources available for those who are interested in a deeper dive on the topics that we have been discussing today. Um, we have a full day workshop uh, that we have planned for November 10th 
on evolving legal standards for LGBTQ plus students. Um, and we are very excited to have that opportunity to do a deep dive on these critical topics. So in today's PowerPoint, you have a link uh, to that workshop. And we have a number of online courses that we have developed that touch on various aspects of the issues that we have been dealing with today, including courses addressing our anti-bullying Bill of Rights, um, an anti-bullying specialist certificate program. Um, we will have coming out very soon, uh, new courses addressing student mental health protocols and affirmative action officer online certificate program. And we do have a, an ongoing Legal One podcast that also um, has touched on this issue in a number of our episodes. Uh, so we encourage you to look at those resources. Um, and of course, we'll always uh, be looking to add to those moving forward. Um, so um, as we are wrapping up, uh, Karen, do you want to close us out? Sure thing. Thanks, David. Um, I'd first like to thank all of our presenters today, um, our, our panelists, and just sharing their experiences, their perspective. Um, I also want to share, I put it into the chat, but we are going to be doing a roundtable in the near future on this topic, which um, I, I am I'm stunned as I have gotten more increasingly involved in, uh, in NJPSA and FBA at how much I really value these roundtables. I knew I did last year as a principal, um, especially going through COVID and dealing with um, the practical information that came out of those. But the roundtables are just a fantastic opportunity to come and just talk best practices. And we're not gonna pre be presenting. You're gonna bring your ideas. You're gonna talk about what works, share the resources that have worked for you and leave with hopefully a list of things that will support you. So please be on the lookout for that information in the near future. We are always here to support you in all that you do, not just in this particular topic, of course. If you have questions about this presentation um, or suggestions for anything that we can do to support you, please reach out to Dave Nash, Donna McInerney, me, uh, the, the general number at NJPSA, any one of us, and we are happy to do what we can to support you in taking care of the students of New Jersey, as well as in protecting you know, your own interests and rights and uh, as, as the school leaders that you are. Um, it really does take a hugely collaborative effort to make a difference in our schools. And I am just amazed every day at what I see New Jersey school leaders doing. And um, there's a reason we're number one in the state, but I think it starts with our heart far more than it does with our academics. And when we build an environment where our students feel valued and see the potential in themselves to be successful, the success follows. So with that being said, I wanna remind you that the video is going to be available afterwards along with the full slide deck. Um, it'll be sent out and you'll be able to access it on our resources page. And I just wish you the absolute best of luck with all that you're doing this school year. We are here to, to serve you and to assist you in any way possible. So please don't hesitate. And with that, I bid you adieu. Have a wonderful day.